Hey guys, so the last time I had an iPhone was the iPhone 3GS which came out in 2009 and I remember switching to Samsung and I've been with Android ever since 2010. So for the last 10 years I've bought into the Android ecosystem. This is the first time in 10 years I'm actually switching back to iPhone. So I have the iPhone 12 Pro, I'm switching from my Google Pixel 4 XL. This video will cover a few topics, I've got a whole bunch of list of items of me and my experience of switching everything from the last 10 years of being an Android person over to being an iPhone person. So hopefully this video is useful to anyone else who's an Android user and wants to switch to the iPhone. These are some things you need to be aware of, some things to note. Maybe it might help you make a decision if this is the right thing to do, but it's not very easy to make that switch. So I'm gonna cover things like how to back up and transfer everything you've had on your Android phone to iPhone. I've also covered things that you lose in terms of the functionalities and the features. I'm also going to cover a bit about the pains that I've felt by using an iPhone compared to using an Android phone for the last 10 years. And finally, I'm going to cover the last topic, which is the gains. One of the reasons why I've switched to an iPhone. So the things that this can do that Android is not capable to do. So let's go ahead and get straight into it. Okay, so starting off with just the backup and transfer items, the first thing I wanted to do is transfer all of my apps. Now there isn't any real easy way to do this, I tried to research it and obviously because the app stores are completely different, there is a lot of similarities in apps that you can get like for like, but I found it easier to actually have my Android phone next to me and manually download one by one all of the apps from the iOS app store took me a whole day to pretty much get everything installed and I had about a hundred and so apps. So it is time consuming. It's something if you're gonna be using an iPhone long term, you're gonna to have to do that. So re-downloading them one by one is the strategy I used for that. The next thing is my WhatsApp messages. Now there is no way to transfer all of your WhatsApp backup messages onto an iPhone and vice versa, you can't go back the other way. So I had to download an external tool and that is called Mobile Trans which is by a company called Wondershare. So have a look at this screen recording. It does quite a few things. Now it's made not just for WhatsApp transfer, but I had to use this to transfer everything from my WhatsApp on my Google Pixel to the WhatsApp I've installed on the iPhone 12 Pro. But you can also use other chat services like Viber and WeChat to transfer everything from there as well. But this is also able to transfer things from your phone like contacts, text messages, pictures, ringtones, photos, wallpapers, videos, all of that kind of stuff as you can see here. And it's pretty easy to do so, you just have to connect both phones with the original charging cables directly to your laptop, it will get picked up by this app. And then you just start the transfer and it should go flawlessly as it did with me. One thing I didn't use the app for was to transfer the contacts because I had all my contacts synced to my Gmail account and I logged into Gmail on my iPhone 12 Pro and I synced contacts through there and it just came out into the contacts page perfectly fine. Then also with the photos, all of my photos were stored on uh, Google Photos, so I just re-downloaded the Google Photos app and had it all there straight away. Now of course, having the photos appear onto the iPhone Photos app, it will sync to iCloud, which is not a major issue, but you'll have that duplication, so you'd have to get two syncs happening at the same time, so when you take a picture, it will sync to Google Photos and it will sync to iCloud, so that's something just to be aware of. And finally, the last thing was about the whole cloud service backup in general. So I pay premium for Dropbox and for Google Drive. And those were my backup solutions to the cloud for the last 10 years. Now I have signed up for iCloud and I'm gonna be using that, well, I'm forced to use that actually, for backing up everything. And they only give you five gigabytes of free storage and that pretty much ran out on the second day of using it because I was recording some 4K videos and that pretty much maxed out, as well as the 100 applications I downloaded, my iCloud storage. So I had to upgrade, which actually wasn't too expensive for the 50 gigabyte storage, which was 79p per month. So I upgraded to that, but now I have three cloud storage accounts that I need to maintain. So those are the main things I need to cover about how to transfer everything over. If you have any specific questions about transferring anything from your Android phone to your iPhone, drop a comment, I'll try to help you out. So now let's move on to the things that I've lost since I've transferred to iPhone. So the first thing that I believe everyone is aware of is the loss of functionality on custom launchers, themes, icons, widgets, all of that kind of stuff. There's so much flexibility you can do on an Android. I use the custom launcher called Nova Launcher and there was really cool gestures that you can even use in the launcher which I used quite a lot. 
there was one where I can lock the screen by just pinching anywhere on the screen and it automatically locks. It was quick and easy rather than pressing the sleep button on the side of the phone. So obviously Apple is quite restrictive. You can't have custom app icons, custom themes. They've introduced widgets now in the new iOS, which is fine, but it's very, very limited in how you can be more flexible in arranging those widgets. Secondly, I used a lot of air gestures. Now this is specifically for the Google Pixel 4 XL. This is not for every Android phone, but I've used air gestures to basically, when you approach the phone without even touching it, it wakes up and it makes it quicker and easier to see any notifications you have on your lock screen or to just quickly get into face unlock and get straight into your phone. But I also use this quite a lot to do air gestures for my music. So when I'm playing Spotify on the lock screen, all I have to do, as you can see here, is just swipe my hand over the screen and it will switch to the next song. Now I use this when I'm training at the gym as well. So my hands might be dirty, I might have gloves on, but all I have to do is wave in front and it just goes to the next song and it makes it so much easier and more convenient, which I know I won't be able to do on an iPhone. The next thing I've lost is the functionality of my Galaxy Watch. So if you have an Android smartwatch, just remember that it would still pair with an iPhone and you can get for the most part the top functionalities like notifications and calls coming through, which is absolutely fine. But there's a lot of things that it will be limited because of the Apple ecosystem and the OS that it runs on. So for example, I can't reply back with text messages. I can't use a keyboard to send texts or send emails, that kind of stuff from my watch back to any person in my contacts list. And some other things that are just partially supported, but most important things, they still work fine. But again, I'm using this because it has great battery life compared to the Apple Watch, so I haven't bought into that just yet. But that's just to be aware of, so if you do have an Android smartwatch that works perfectly with your Android smartphone, you may have partial support when you switch over. Another thing that I always use is the always on display. So the lock screen on an Android is always on, I can see the clock and I can just see icons for specific notifications that are always there. The iPhone screen will always stay blank. I can't have an always on display, which I just found very convenient. So I'll just have to live without that for now. The other thing that I really don't like is on the iPhones, the battery percentage, you have to swipe down from the top to see the percentage. Or what I've done now is I've created some widgets on the screens just to see what the percentage is, which is a bit pointless. They used to have the option to turn the battery percentage on all the time. They don't have that now in the new OS. So it's a tiny thing, but it does make a lot of difference when you can see how much battery you have left completely. The next thing I've lost is the power of USB-C charging. So everyone was hoping that the iPhone 12 would have USB-C. It has lightning ports still. Now I have cables all over the place that are USB-C, which would have made my life easier. They're around my house, they're upstairs in my bedroom, downstairs, in my car, in my office, wherever I go, it would have made things a lot easier. But now I have to buy more lightning port to USB-C cables to just cope with this phone's charging capabilities. It's not the biggest loss of functionality, but it just would have made things a lot easier if they had done that. And lastly, the final thing in the loss category is the ability to get to the camera by double pressing the power button on the side of the phone. I used to use that all the time to get quick access to my camera. Now I have to just hold down for a couple of seconds the camera shortcut on the lock screen on the iPhone. If they had the option to turn on that double press shortcut or if there's any apps that would do that, I'd like to hear that and uh, that would be so much easier for me. But until then, I'll just make do it's not the end of the world and it's just something to be aware of. Okay, now let's move on to the pains. Now this is a category of things just to note. It's not specifically loss of functionality or anything like that. It's just annoying things that have occurred in my experience after the transfer. So starting off with the first one, I had to reset up all of my smart lights. So I have a lot of Philips Hue lights around the house, the light bulbs, the TV lights, whatever it may be. I need to resync them with my bridge and set them up again. But if you did an Android to Android transfer, all of those settings would have been synced already seamlessly. The second thing is logging into all of your apps again. So obviously I downloaded 100 apps manually. Most of them required an account. So I have to go back and remember what was the login details. I did forgot my password a few times and just logging into things that require more than just a username and password like banking apps. You need to go through a lot of security settings to re-log in and start using that again. But if you spend a whole full solid day just working on apps, going through one by one, then you can get it done. But just remember, that is a bit of a pain to do. Otherwise, all my passwords were synced to my Google account. I couldn't load it because I'm using an iCloud account to run the iPhone, so they weren't synced to that. That's just something to remember. 
Now speaking of the apps, the next thing is I did purchase some apps that I use quite frequently because they're on a completely different system, the different apps, I had to repurchase them. So if you do have something that you pay for, just note that you might need to pay for if it's not linked to a cloud account, then you may need to pay again to work on the iPhone. Then there's also the issues about reconnecting all of the other connected devices via Bluetooth. So whether that's all your headphones, you may have speakers, I've got some gimbals that I used with my phone. I had to reconnect all of them, set them up again. So that's just something else to remember. And finally, the last pain that I had was I've lost progress on a lot of the apps that I was using to track things like even gaming. I've played a lot of games where I'm on level 400 or whatever. All of them are gone. I use fitness apps as well. You lose your progress, you had to start again. If there's ways you can transfer and export backups from those apps, and re-import them into an iPhone app, then that would be great, but I don't think that's gonna be possible all of the time. So just be prepared that you may lose a lot of progress in some apps that you have. That covers all of the pains. Now there are some little pains that might be a non-issue for most people. I'm not gonna cover a lot of details in these, but they are tiny things that I've just noticed, like the notifications for one app to get grouped together on an Android, and then you get just a single app notification on the menu bar for that whereas the iPhone will just list every tiny notification in its own separate line, so you have to scroll through all of them. Then you also have things like the custom keyboard that I've downloaded for the iPhone, because I'm not a fan of the default keyboard. You can't have things like a dedicated comma key. You have to go into the second keyboard settings, press the comma, and then come back, and then continue writing, so that's three taps as compared to one. It might not be a big issue, but you will notice it if you're so used to working in a specific way, and it is very limited in functionality. Then there's also the issue with the back button being at the bottom on an Android. You can just single tap to go back whether you're browsing sites. And in some cases, you can just swipe on the iPhone to go back. But most of the time, you might need to press the back button on the top left of the screen, which as a result, you will need two hands to do that. So it's not great, but I can get used to it. And the last tiny little pain that probably might not be an issue for a lot of people is that you can't transfer all your blocked numbers. So spam callers, cold callers, whatever, you may have a list of blocked numbers because they keep calling you. When I transfer the contacts, they don't get transferred. You'd have to manually add those blocked callers as a contact and then block them afterwards, which is pretty annoying. But in my case, you'll have to just wait for that person to call again and then you can block them from the recent calls. And finally, the gains. So these are the things that the iPhone 12 Pro does really well and allows me to convince myself that I've made the right decision moving away from Android. A couple of these might be the reasons why I've decided to go back to iPhone, but it's something that you guys might sway you into convincing you that maybe iPhone is the right choice to do. So let's take a look at that list. Right, so there's six specific gains that I'd like to highlight. The first one is the HDR video recording on the iPhone 12 Pro with Dolby Vision. Now as a content creator, as a YouTuber, video is a big part of the things that I do. So having the capability of recording awesome video wherever I go, having that in my pocket is something I value so much. So having the quality of this video with the stabilization that I've tested on it, I feel like I can just leave my mirrorless camera behind and not have any worries that I'm not gonna get any good footage. I've tested this, check out my previous iPhone 12 camera review. I'll leave a link in the description below for that. But you can also click here to check that out. The video quality on this is so good and I feel like I can just replace some of my YouTube videos and just record directly from this. So I'm very happy with that. The second thing is the great battery life. I've used this very heavily when I was downloading apps, I was logging into everything, I was backing up, I was transferring a whole day constantly on the phone. Started off with 100%. I think maybe nine hours later, I was down to 58%. My Android definitely would have just been down to zero by that time, completely, even earlier than that. So the battery is just, very convenient. I don't need to worry about taking a power bank or an external power source to make sure it's always charged. I'm so happy with that. The third reason, if like myself, you have a lot of Apple products. So like you see here, I have my MacBook Pro, I have an iPad Pro at home, I have Apple TV connected to my TV, and a lot of my family members have iPhone as well. So I'm already invested into the Apple ecosystem. So this is probably the last missing piece of the puzzle. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to go back to iPhone is to get that missing jigsaw piece of the ecosystem and just cover everything. So now all my devices everywhere are just linked together. So when I'm taking pictures on my iPhone 12 Pro, they'll sync seamlessly to my iCloud account, which is already on my MacBook. 
I can airdrop my photos to myself very easily, very quick. I can take FaceTime calls on my laptop. It makes it so much easier for me to share my iPhone screen onto my TV as well. So there's so many things like that where I feel like I can do all those things where I needed to get third party applications to do that before with an Android. So now I'm fully invested in having all of my devices, including my phones, connected together. The next one is Apple CarPlay. So in my car, I did use Android Auto for my Google Pixel 4 and it was a little bit buggy. Sometimes it connected it, sometimes it didn't detect it. But when it was working, I noticed when I used the navigation for Google Maps, it always froze in the middle of my journey. So it wasn't great. But when I used the iPhone to use Apple CarPlay and then use Apple Maps, it was faster, it was smoother. And I feel like it's a whole completely different system in my car because the response times were five times quicker than the Android Auto one. So it's made the journeys in my car so much better by using the iPhone. So CarPlay is a big benefit for me and I'm gonna use that pretty much almost every day when I'm driving. So it's a, it's a big thumbs up on that front. Number five is the simplicity. Now, what I mean by simplicity is the Android market is so saturated. There's so many different things that you're overcrowded for choice. Now you have third party applications, you have loads of different phone companies now building on top of the Android Google system. So you don't know really which one is the best one to go for because you have companies like Samsung and Huawei, they have their own OS that is built on top of the, the Google OS. So what I'm trying to talk about with the simplicity point of view is let's say if you go to a restaurant, you have a menu which has 200 items on it, you're spoiled for choice. Let's just say that's an Android menu. Then you go to a different restaurant, you only have 10 things on the menu. It makes things so much easier. It allows you to be more decisive. You can choose things very quickly and you just know what you're gonna get. Last but not least is the A14 Bionic chip. So that is the fastest processing chip on any smartphone right now. Have a look at this screenshot by Geekbench. You can see in comparison to the Snapdragon 865, so things like the CPU performance, the gaming performance, the battery life, which is what one of the things I highlighted as a game, and then a nano review overall. So you can see it beats it in every category. So having that fast processing, no lags, it's just smooth. When I'm using the applications, when I'm switching screens, when I'm going background apps, it just makes everything so quick and so easy to do. The gamings, I downloaded a few games straight away and I was playing with it. It was like a completely different experience from when I was playing games on my Google Pixel 4. So I'm so happy in that front. So that covers everything that I think you guys need to know. If you are going to an iPhone after many years with an Android, these are the things to be aware of. Hopefully I covered the things that you might want to know. If there's anything else you wanna know about my experience in this transfer, drop a comment down below. Otherwise, I have a tons more iPhone 12 videos coming out, which I know you're gonna like. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, make sure you like this video, and I will catch you guys next time. Take care.